The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Mason Stevens Limited, ABN 91141 447 207, AFSL 351 578, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Decision. The opinions expressed within the podcast are solely the individuals and do not reflect the opinions and beliefs of Mason Stevens. Hello and welcome. My name is Brendan Dade, Senior Financial Advisor at Lorica Partners. Thank you for joining me on this deep dive into all things investment committees. We'll be talking about how to start one, how to make the most of this part of an advice business, and some of the best practices uh, that go into making these work really well. It will be a four-part series where we hear from some of the leading minds about how to make investment committees work. Thanks for joining me. This series is brought to you by Mason Stevens, a specialist wealth platform provider that focuses on managed account solutions. Recognized by Investment Trends in 2023 as the most improved platform and by advisor ratings in 2022 for best advisor support, Mason Stevens offers outsourced CIO services that complement their platform and managed account solutions. Established in 2010, Mason Stevens is led by some of Australia's most experienced finance and investment professionals. Well, good morning and welcome to episode three of this podcast where we're exploring all things investment committees. Uh, Today, I'm joined by Greg Barter, who is a principal advisor at Allied Wealth and the chair of his investment committee. So welcome, Greg. Thank you. I'm very pleased to be here. Thanks for ha- thanks for joining us. It's uh, it's going to be a good chat. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, as am I. <laughs> very good. So I think it'd be great just to start at the top, Greg, if you could, and just uh, give us a little introduction um, about uh, yourself, how you came to be where you are today. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, so Allied Wealth is a is a, a new business. It's been around for three years, um, and principally, um, I joined about a bit over a year ago, um, along with another colleague. So a, a relatively small practice, um, but very early on, we we decided that one of our our positions was going to be to um, that of independence, um, and then we thought about how we want to run our investment piece, um, and it. It naturally occurred to us that we had to have our own IC to, to be in keeping with that, that view. Mm. Um, I was asked to establish the IC um, uh, because of my history in, in other organisations, having been a member of an IC for a pretty large organisation. And so we went through the process of establishing the IC uh, a bit over a year ago, as well as setting up all the the proceeds, uh, processes, I should say, mm-hmm. uh, and the objectives of the IC at the time, um, which seemed seemed to be a pretty simple thing to do. But when you actually start to think about it in detail, it's it, <laughs> it's one of those Pandora's boxes where you you think it's um, reasonably simple, having been a member of an IC before. But you, it's what the the unseen part is the the, the part of the iceberg underneath the underneath the water, as they say. Where there's a whole bunch of stuff behind uh, what is, goes into an IC. So, just for example, how long did that? How long did you expect it might take, and uh, how long did it actually take in practice? Well, we're still going through um, elements. So we've got the the rudimentaries, like everyone in the room talking to one another and, and, and making noises <laughs> like they're a working IC quite quickly. Very good. Um, but that's one of the points which we might talk about afterwards, which is what we did wrong. Um, but then uh, the the charter was reasonably quick, um, but then we kept pushing forward and, and as many of the listeners may be in small businesses, you say, okay, we'll do that later and you don't actually get around to it. Um, yeah. One which which is still pending is our conflicts of interest policy, mm-hmm. um, which is important for us being independent. Um, but we've sort of, I, I think we agreed in the first meeting that this is what we're going to do, but it hasn't actually been formalised yet. So it's one of those cases where you rush to get the people in the room with the expertise and with the the good intentions, um, but then getting the the detail to make sure it has the 
due process behind it. It might take a bit longer. Yeah. yeah. So, for example, I, I imagine you're very comfortable, you know, buying uh, a guest IC uh, member a coffee uh, to come in and give their <laughs> input, but you probably don't want a fundy, uh, you know, buying you guys, you know, a Ferrari or something like that. Yeah. And yeah. Um, somewhere in the middle is probably correct. Okay. And we've, I mean, recently we, we um, asked an independent person to come in and do an audit of our, our process recently and they put out a whole bunch of things which were really embarrassing for us but kind of we knew but we were sort of get, about to get to. So, yeah, so it's it's the process of establishment needs to be deliberate mm. um, uh, but the actual function of the IC with the 90% of the good stuff that they do, you can get happening relatively quickly as long as you've got um, everyone with the similar interests um working towards what you want to do okay okay so let's uh so to put some put a uh, finer point on it you, you all get around you agree that this is what we want to do as a practice everyone's in alignment great uh you want to get up to that sort of 90 percent of the good stuff what are we talking three months six months a uh, year? for us it was yeah for us it was relatively quick um and that would the benefit in in our state well it's who do you want to be on your IC, right? And what's the mm. composition of the IC? So our decision was each of the principal uh, or which of the owners of the business would be in the IC, but we needed a sufficient um, independent um, input to make sure that mm-hmm. the it was reasonably rounded out. Um, because some of us have been around, i.e. me, have been around long enough to know better. We sort of knew people in the industry who we wanted to um, approach. Mm-hmm. And thankfully, the, the two principal people who we approached were eager to, to join us. But I can imagine if you're a new business and you're wondering who you should approach, that would be a big deal. Yeah. Actually choosing the the, the, the people who have the same alignment as you. Um, thankfully, we already had that. So that's that shortcut of that process quite quickly. Yeah, so I sure. think we were between sending an email out to having our first IC, it might have been a month. Yeah, okay, right. With no, <clears throat> with no sort of um, detail behind the IC other than everyone, let's get together and work out how we're going to do it. Um, but as I said before, the thing we shortcutted was the external members who we were inviting, we, we had known for, in some cases, 15, 20 years. So it was easy to fit them in. Um, yeah, if, you were, if you're thinking about it from a different point of view where you're trying to work out who you'd like to um, invite, that would be a lot different and you'd need to go through a process where you, in, a, in a essence, the, the – the, the IC in in its formation would would need to go through any uh, I guess an, an inquiry process to make sure the person who they were inviting in was going to be the right fit. Yeah, sure. So you you basically had the team more or less out of the box. Yes. Um, you knew who you wanted to have involved. Yes. That shortcuts the process massively. Yes. Anyone else who sort of needs to then go and form their own team, um, that's its own sort of process that people are going to need to go through. And I guess that's as long as a piece of string in some ways. Yeah. Yeah, but I guess the point I'm trying to make here, um, probably labouring it too much, is the selection of the external parties. They they have to be in sync with the rest of the business, but they have to have enough authority to question if the business if they're going down the wrong line. If if, you, if that makes sense, yeah. But the whole benefit of having um, independent members on the IC is they stop same think within the organisation because you can you can. You can corral yourself down a, an avenue where, it, if you're thinking the same as your business partners, you need that external reality check to make sure that you, you're not going down the wrong line. Yeah. Sure. So um, that's I would encourage people who are thinking about setting up an IC to really make sure you you choose people not who are your mates, which is what we did, but in addition to that, people who you know will question what you're doing um, in order to make. To make that IC work effectively, which needs to be, there needs to be some sort of tension in so, in so much that each member has an equal say, mm. um, and each member's um, point of view needs to be heard. Um, but ultimately, the the IC needs to come to an agreement as well. So you don't <laughs> want to have out and out um, conflict every time. Mm. Uh, but you need to have enough, just enough tension and just enough um, capacity for every member to have their piece and have their say. Um, that it's a constructive environment rather than just a, a rubber stamp. Yeah, sure. Okay, so I think what I, what I hear you saying is you you really need to make sure that or the team that you've got is going to keep 
everybody sharp enough to, to be effective, um, but not, <laughs> not in all that conflict so that no decisions get made. Uh, you know, you can't actually decide on any changes that need to be done to a portfolio, to a manager, all that sort of stuff needs to have a degree of flow. So that yeah. something actually happens, but at the same time, <laughs> if you you can't have it just go too much with the flow, otherwise there's no benefit. Correct. And you, you don't find that there's actually anything that you wouldn't otherwise just be able to do from the desk by yourself. Correct. And uh, you know, run so it all if, on your own. If stand. you surround people with, oh, well, you take it to extremes to prove the point, right? You go to one extreme, you go, everyone agrees with you. Well, then why have an IC? It, 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 yeah, sure, it's a rubber stamp, and sure, that gives uh, it provides some. It's some validity to what you're doing, but if everyone's just agreeing, mm. then um, that's there's there's no value out there. You get the other extreme if everyone's disagreeing with each other and 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 fundamentally, um, you know, it's it, you can't a- arrive at respectfully arrive at agreement even if you disagree, then you're not getting anywhere either. So mm. you need to have that. That's what I was saying about the tension. You need that. If you think about those extremes where mm. ultimately everyone wants to agree, but ultimately no one's going to agree unless they really believe it. So somewhere in between, there's got to be a position where th- there's constructive disagreement, if that's a, yeah, if that's of course. A, a terminology. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. And so just sort of diving into that, can you give us an example or are there any examples that come to mind of some of a topic that you've raised or that's been raised in the IC that you've had to deal with um, that sort of fits this camp where you know maybe it's something that you personally would not have seen uh happen as far as a decision of the committee goes but you know you've decided that that's uh something that you know we're all going to do yeah well that's a question without notice <laughs> I'll, I'll <laughs> give me a moment to think about that but i guess ultimately um i'm just i'm throwing my mind back to um some of the more recent ics where um, the way that the, the flow we go with, with with the externals, we've chosen given each of them um, uh, subject matter expertise that they provide information to. So we've got two externals in our IC. One is the top down. One, the way I think about it, the top down. The one is the, the bottom up. Mm-hmm. And so, um, so the uh, at the outset we have the top down um, view, and um, uh, Eddie, the, the external who is is providing their view. Was giving the view, and halfway through it, the um, the gentleman Hugh, who provides a bottom up uh, point of view, sort of jumped in and said, "I fundamentally disagree with that." And then everyone went, <laughs> "All right, this is going to be fun." Saying, yeah. oh, okay, how are we going to go with that? Um, well, ultimately, it was it, it, they agreed to disagree, but it was also it, it, what it did do is um, provide a, a, a an avenue for which Eddie could then. Um, go into more detail. It was a contentious mm-hmm. issue. He went into more detail about what his point of view was, um, and then ultimately, Hugh was saying, "Oh, okay, maybe I misunderstood the the premise." Right. Um, and so, I guess it teased out more than just the just the superficial point of view. Sure. And is this, or do you find that most of this is around asset allocation, or is this manager selection, or all of the above? Uh, the manager selection, um, we generally in a grants, um, so that doesn't so far hasn't provided a lot of a lot of tension. The asset allocation, largely, we've been in a grant so far. So um, while I was, I sounded high handed about having that creative tension between us. We, I don't think we've we've really come to a point where there's people sitting on each side of the room, like disagreeing and. <laughs> And pulling mm. the pulling the knives out to, to um and, and standing their ground, uh, so I would have it expect it more about the um the feed the, the view the economic feed which then informs the asset allocation which then informs the manager selection and that's where we where we encourage the the differing opinions, mm-hmm. um and so that's so far where we've found the um the, the different points of view will come about by the time we. We rationalise those different point of views, so we agree to a sort of common um, way forward. By the time that, when that then feeds into the asset allocation manager selection, that's already given, um, uh, because I guess it's uh, from the because we choose a we have a, a tactical asset allocation approach. So obviously, if we were agreeing on the, the the bigger picture, then the the actual tactical change is going to be 
um, it's, it's relatively easy to be aligned with that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And and tell me uh, from from a client perspective, or or for the advisors perhaps uh, who aren't on the on the IC, um, how do you find how do you find having an IC helps the rest of the business? So let's just say. You know, from what you've told me, you, you you managed to strike a balance. You've got a you got a good team. You're happy with how those discussions go. Um, there's a bit of argy bargy, not too much, not you know. Not, um, but that's that that finds a rhythm, right? Okay, so just fast forwarding into say maybe the ordinary flow of the IC is being a nested part of your business. Yeah. I'm curious to know, you know, how does how do you find that component interfaces with the other advisors who aren't on there. Um, how yeah. do, what does that look like and how does that work? And Well, from uh, starting from a client's point of view, uh, so a, a lot of my clients came from a, a larger institution mm-hmm. and so um, and they, uh, we struck a deal with them and, they, and a lot of clients came across. So we did an analysis about um, early on what do the clients actually want mm-hmm. and so we wanted to replicate a process where – they, they, the look and feel is, is the benefits they retain, but then the, the, then they also gain the benefits of a of a more boutique, smaller business, right? Hang on, that's a million dollar question. What did they want? Uh, well, <laughs> well it, we might have got it wrong, but they wanted um, reasonable fees. That's that's a given. Mm-hmm. Um, we thought they wanted independence, um, and so, but not everybody does. But that, that was a that was one of our, our key deliverables. Mm-hmm. Um, but the other part is they wanted um, due process when it came to investments. So right. that meant that they didn't want to come across a guy who was trying to catch the falling knife, which is the old analogy of being able to pick the best stock for a month. They wanted to have they wanted to have the due process that they saw in what in, an investment committee could provide. Yeah. Um, so the security of a, of a larger outfit with all the research and team that surrounds make sure correct. big so mistakes they, don't happen. Yeah, they didn't want yeah. one bloke just picking stocks yeah. Um, yeah, who sure. might be brilliant or might be useless, right? So and so the, the trade-off is you, you could have that brilliant guy who can pick all the stocks by himself, yeah, but reality is there's, there's very few of those, yeah. if any. So um, that what as – as most of the research people would do, would, clients are more worried about losing money than gaining money. So it's they want to make sure that the the investment process is is thorough, reasonably conservative, and has a logical process. Right. So yeah. the investment committee provides that. Um, it's kind of like a reference to a higher power in the sense of um, you're talking to a client. Um, we believe blah blah blah. So um, if you if you're using statements like that. It or instantly gives the client the feeling that there's been a process behind what we believe, as opposed to yeah, I sure. believe interest rates are going to go up um, next week or not. Uh, so um, they, it, it's the feeling that clients, the security that clients get, right? And um, while a small business can't pro- provide that security, but if you provide, if you also explain to clients that the whole custodial process, where it doesn't matter how big the business is, it's all about. Um, the, the decisions that they're making. So we wanted to bring the um, the comfort of due process to the to the investment process. And in the case of where my clients were coming from, we wanted to make it replicate similar to what they were already used to. So yeah, a tactical sure. asset allocation sure. um, within a strategic um, asset allocation. Um, but but for us. We also wanted to control that process. Yeah, sure. So um, again, so that the choice for us to insource versus outsource um, the investment committee piece, um, we felt more um, uh, control and 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 more ownership of the process. And so, therefore, when we're explaining to the clients, it, it seems more genuine, right? So we we were sitting in the we were sitting in the committee making these decisions. And so, therefore, right or wrong, we're going to stick by them. But also, we can quite readily give clients the rationale behind it. So, clients will forgive you if you're wrong for the right reason, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, uh, when you think about investment community and maybe the listeners might want to think about themselves, you're an advisor, you're sitting in, in an organization um, and you're trying to explain the, the investment piece to a client 
if you have ownership of that investment piece with via the investment committee which you um, have influence over, it's much more compelling to the clients than if it was we read this um, uh, the AFR. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, well, like, so, like we get a memo from the some external investment committee. Oh, I see. And that explains yes. what we're doing, and okay. then I'm. Oh, then I'm explain. I'm supposed to explain to the clients, and I don't like. I stay within my lanes, and I do. So, so yeah, you clients more- want to feel like there's yeah. due process behind it, but the advisor is intimately involved with it. I guess that's our view. Yeah, you um, want the nexus, right? You you don't want this to be something that's been picked up off the shelf. That yeah, that so that is too removed from the client and the advisors in the business. Correct. So yeah. that I guess you you're managing, and this is because it's an informed audience. We're, we're we're managing the fact that you need to have model portfolio. In our view, we need to have model portfolios to, in order to manage the client base effectively. Yep. But you 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 need to make the client feel that their portfolio is the only one, right? So that while they you're choosing a model portfolio for them, which is informed by the investment committee, um, you you the client wants to know that that model portfolio has been tailored to their personal needs, mm. and that if something came up from their their side. That you're not going to just say you still get this same model portfolio if that makes sense. Yeah, sure. You got a company director of an ASX listed company. He's got a whole stack of, um, you know, whatever um, shares as part of that. You know, yeah. you, you want to be able to tailor the Aussie equity component to, you know, not double up too much or, Correct. or whatever. Right? Correct. So the client wants to feel that they have due process behind their their portfolio and that you know there's there's people more than one person thinking about it, but they also want to feel like that portfolio is built just for them, mm. if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so I guess to, to sort of tie a bow around that, uh, it's your sense that the IC is really uh, a, a confidence piece in some ways to the to the rest of the business that supports the conversations with clients, that gives clients um, the assurance that this isn't just one person, <laughs> correct? You know, forming their own opinions and 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 running off. That it's it's something that's has got the ability to catch really bad calls um, yeah. and and big mistakes and make sure that sure it might not be uh, you know you might not be timing markets um, like a magician, yeah. But it is it's still something that's going to help serve them well long term. Yeah, that's right, and and that that sort of. Touching on the the importance of the the independent members of the investment committee cannot be part of the business. They've got to have they've got to be brought in to um, uh, provide uh, cross pollinization as much as possible because you don't want the business to be insular. You need to um, you need to be able to include and the clients want to feel that you're getting. Um, a broader view of the of the markets as opposed to just one business's point of view. Mm. Um, so we, as I said, our investment committee has been running for for a year now. Um, we've 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 got to think about how we make sure we don't become too uh, same think. I guess if that's not a word, but but you probably group get think. the principle what I'm talking <laughs> group about. Think. Same thing. Yeah, group think. Group Thank think. You. That's yeah. where I'm. That's where I'm going with. So. You, you you need to make sure you're still you're always evolving and you're always I'm coming back to that um, creative tension in the in the investment committee where you, you want to make sure that there's new points of view and um, and differing points of view than the the existing members in there. So we've got to think about how we do that, and that might be just inviting say non-voting external members to come on board mm. to give their point of view, and then that create that gives us more material to fight over. Uh, but that's that's something which we're now looking forward to is having it being an investment committee which has been around for a, for a year. How do we keep the the ideas fresh and and that not being closed minded about how we're thinking about things? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, and so just to give us a bit of colour now that you're a year in, um, how much time and effort? Do you think this sort of requires to to run well? You know, how often do you guys meet? What sort of what sort of preparation goes into uh, presumably the minutes and or agenda of the of the of the committee meeting? 
um, how much sort of follow-up work is there after, how much can you push that to the uh, outsourced guys so you can get back to everything else you need to do. Yeah, yeah time and effort, how does that, yeah, so how the, does that look? As you well know, advisor's time is always is, is going to be stretched. But it, the commitment is is reasonable. Yeah. Um, I'm talking from a reasonably small business mm, from that yeah. point of view. So I, as the as the chair of the committee, I prepare the um, the agenda beforehand. I and I um, make sure everyone knows what they need to produce for for the committee. Mm-hmm. Um, produce, make sure I do the follow up afterwards and, and produce the minutes and the rest of it. That time commitment isn't huge. So the we meet on a quarterly basis. Um, okay. So ahead of the ahead of the quarterly meeting, um, it might be a day for me to get all the coordination stuff together, and I might have a day afterwards. Um, the externals bring um, one guy, Eddie, the top down stuff. He does a it, it, there's there's a commitment on on his side, mm-hmm. um, and he'll bring uh, basically. The, the tactical ass allocation view, mm-hmm. um, and he also was the the brains behind the the composition of the model portfolios. Uh, then you've got Hugh, the other side. He's a fund manager, direct equities guy, and for him the commitment isn't huge because he's doing it already. So all he's doing is right. the knowledge he already has is is fashioning for our committee. Right. Um, we want the clients to be pretty close to the committee outcomes and and have it timely as well. So. One of the the key deliverables after the quarterly meeting is we'll send a newsletter out to clients with, you know, with the, uh, I guess without n- not too much technical detail, but at least a, a feeling for what the committee's um, points of view are and what changes they can expect. All oh, right, so that goes to the whole client base. Yeah, the client base yeah, will right. get that, and we try and our our, um, our delivery standard is like within within three weeks of the committee sitting, okay. so that. And the way that we synchronise things is we try and get most of our client meetings following the committee. So you, you're talking; they've got the they've got the um, the newsletter already, and so we're talking about what the committee view is. So we, that's how we mm-hmm. drag the committee, um, I guess, credibility into the meetings when we're talking about the investment piece. Right. Okay. So they've read the well, you know, as clients <laughs> as clients want yeah. to do, yeah. they can read it. So the one in ten will probably read it, but the other. The other um, nine will probably have a like a bird's eye view, and, and but yeah. then you're reminding him again. So I guess it's it's that reinforcement, um, and so that's why the how the committee is central to that client engagement point of view. Yeah. Um, so that 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 goes out. Uh, that's a um, newsletter, and then we have the client meetings, and so you can see the cycle goes on and on. Sure. I don't. It, my point of view, it's not too onerous. Um, uh, but I think it would become – we have the advantage of being a relatively small business. There's only three principal advisors, so mm-hmm. the agility that comes with that we take advantage of. The larger the organisation, the, the slower the, the the wheels may turn. Mm. Um, but, but you've still got reporting and everything, right? Like, you know, you're going to have a look at what those model portfolios have done correct. quarter to quarter, right? Yeah, so, so someone's got to pull that together. Yeah, so that, that's Eddie. Benchmark. Um, so the, I would – I haven't asked him personally, but I've seen some emails come through at, at late night because he's got a full time job. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so I, I'm going to uh, guess that his commitment before the committee is probably two days. Right. Okay. Um, okay. Um, doing the doing the uh, I guess the review and benchmarking of the how the models are going, but because he's he's. His normal job is complementary to what he's doing. So again, kind of like Hugh, all he's doing is translating what he's doing day to day into and and repurposing for for what we need for the committee. So I guess we were lucky when we went back to the when we got the people together. We 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 maybe we landed on our feet by by choosing the right people, um, uh, not by accident, by accident by design. I guess is the best way of putting it. Yeah. So the. Uh, Ultimately, the, the question is: was how much time is involved? And, mm-hmm. and my point of view is, it's it's modest compared to the benefits you get. Yeah, okay. um, coming out at the other side of the committee of of you having ownership of the process as an advisor, but the the also the client feeling that they've got a a, a portfolio which is is designed just for them, mm-hmm. as opposed to. You know, whatever you can get off the shelf from any sort of industry fund. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's excellent. No, thanks for thanks for sharing that, Greg. 
I'm curious to know as well um, from an from an investment perspective, and this is going to be very very hard to try and put your finger on. But do you have a sense that uh, you know if you if you were to sort of stare down into your own <laughs> into your own heart and soul as much as you can, do you think that the investment portfolios are doing better? as a result of having an IC as opposed to what you might do internally in a business? And is there any examples that you could maybe draw upon to to give us a flavor of why you think that's the case? You know, without, you know, saying, oh, yeah, I really thought that <laughs> – I really thought 2020 was going to, you know, go down yeah, double no, what, it, a, what it did or – That is actually a really good question. Are the clients getting – what do the clients want? That's mm. – you're breaking it down into two things. And mm. if it's better returns – is having your own IC going to produce – if it was just better returns, is the IC going to produce that compared to anything else off the shelf? The answer for that bit is probably not. We feel like we're doing better um, and we feel like we have control, which was, I guess, one of the integral parts of, of us wanting independence. Mm. Um, and But comparatively to the returns of other options, there's, probably, there's plenty of people out there – can provide you with returns. I think the um, the unseen benefit is what I was sort of alluding to or, or said outright before is the control and the the ownership and the clients getting that transferred ownership to them. So you can you, you can go to uh, Australian Super and get their balance fund. You get a good outcome, right? And the the returns are pretty good. But how how closely do you feel? alignment with that portfolio because it's off the shelf, right? Sure. So the clients are coming for – so um, one of the other fundamentals we thought clients wanted was that boutique feel, right? So when we, was, we were saying what are, we, what are the principles, one was independence, um, boutique experience, and then having a due process in the investment committee. So that for that boutique experience, that investment committee is required. If, if you think yeah, that's sure. – if that's one of the building blocks of your business, which it is for ours, yeah. you need it, right? So we we could be wrong, but we've got enough clients who think that's right. So that's all we want, right? Mm. So do you get a better outcome by having an investment committee? It depends. Is it quantitative or is it qualitative? Yeah. The okay. quantitative part is if be- I'm being really honest and I stand like 100 paces back and put my ego in a box, you get in the same thing. You could – probably get the same thing from Australian Super Balance Fund, right? So but the qualitative part is where it's where it's where it where the rubber hits the road. Um where we're controlling the process um and and as a byproduct of that, the clients feel that feeds into the boutique feel of the organization. Yeah, sure. And and you get the opportunity presumably to add that level of customization that goes on Correct. top where required, right? You know. Correct. I mean, like, I guess this is a simple example. Um, we've reintroduced hybrids to the clients' portfolios mm-hmm. recently. I've, I mean, uh, in other organizations where I've come from, it was too large to have hybrids in the portfolio because you, you know they, the market, they couldn't yeah. acquire them. <clears throat> yeah. There's just not enough out there to move the market. Um, but it's a nice little addition to the portfolios right now where um, – uh, as income's growing, and you can add this in, and and I mean yourself and the listeners might um, have enough experience to know that often when a client meeting you're talking about one thing they can take away and remember, and so the addition of hybrids in the portfolio where we can explain what a hybrid is, how it works, and oh you're getting seven percent um, income yield with that, isn't that great? They're not going to remember anything else. And it mightn't be the least important part of the portfolio, but they walk away going, I understand how this works and, oh, they're doing this for us. So I guess – and it's not, and it's, it's not um, witchcraft or anything like that, but it's more about that – it goes back to the question you asked before, is are the clients getting a better better outcome? Mm. They want to feel like their portfolio is, is personally managed for them. Mm. And in, in our point of view, that um, it has to be done with an IC because if you're outsourcing it, um, you can probably get the same outcome from an investment return point of view, but do you get that same uh, feeling for the client if you if you're after a boutique approach? Are you achieving that if you're if it's outsourced? Is, so that's that's kind of how we landed where we did. Yeah, sure. I mean, you could take yeah. I guess there's there's two extremes you could take to that. You could take a very cynical one and say, oh, well, if it's just all about the numbers and it's the same, then why bother? But as we know. 
you know, as practitioners, the reality is that, you know, we're not, we're not that cold and calculated rational beings that we like to think that we are. Yeah. Um, we're heavily influenced by the behavioral side. Yeah. And like you say, if someone gets the sense that there's a connection to what the portfolio is, how it's built in their own situation, then that's, that drives far more productive behavioral or, or qualitative yeah. outcomes that are probably equally as hard to measure. But your sense is that that's paying paying off really well for, for yeah. your business. Yeah, if not in the, um, the, 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 the qualitative side of the, the client feeling of boutique um, approach, right? So yeah. um, the qualitative side, you can, you can just get Vanguard Balance Fund or I've said yeah. – yeah, and that's a that's a good outcome, yeah. nice and cheap. Yeah. But if the clients feel connected with that, um, and like I'm, this is not to suggest that anyone who chooses that approach is wrong. But this is this was the fabric of how we build our business, and so that's why it it naturally fell to us. So that's the way to go. Yeah, sure. I mean, client, there are there are a range of different clients out there who got these preferences. So yeah, you, you got to make sure it fits for your business, I guess. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> so that look, it sounds like things are. Are up and running and humming and, uh, and and going reasonably well for the for the most part. Are there any sort of major errors that you feel that was made in the establishment of your, or maybe not so much the establishment, but just through your journey of of being of chairing an IC? Is there anything you go, oh, crap? I would have gone back and yeah. <laughs> done I mean, that differently if I could have. Or? Sadly, sadly, there are many. But um, <laughs> I won't, that just means you're I honest. Let, Greg. I won't let you see behind the the uh, curtain of the Wizard of Oz too much. Yeah. But uh, one fundamental, and this, if this the the the, um, the the I guess the outcome of this podcast is for people to be able to work out. If they want to set up an IC and then how to do it, mm. um, the we spoke before about how rapidly we got it together because we knew the people we wanted to choose. That was also the weakness because in our um, in our haste to get something set up um, and all the goodwill, uh, I guess the good intentions of everyone who was joining the committee, um, we didn't think too hard about you know how how are we going to. How the how do the external parties are going to get paid, or how they how, what do they get out of this contribution? Mm-hmm. Um, and so we sort of had a handshake agreement to start with, and and in in one case, um, the individual had just taken up a role in a, in a large fund manager. Um, he was under probation, and so he kind of said, "I can't actually ask my bosses if I can do this yet because." You know, I need to get past probate. So you've got to be <laughs> yeah, realistic. Yeah, of course. So we will sit. We actually had to sit there for I think it was about six months, eight months, um, with not even knowing with this individual who was doing some of the core work for us was able to, you know, um, reveal actually, himself as being a member of job. OIC, right? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so that was that was a tense time. It turned out okay because um, ultimately. Uh, he approached the business and they said, yes, you can do this, ex- have this external role. Um, but then what came with that is uh, we had an agreement as far as how, how is everyone going to get, particularly the external guys, what's how are we going to keep uh, uh, keep them engaged other than it's good to work with some nice people, Yeah. but also make it clear that it's arm's length because, we, again, we had this independence piece we were working with. Um so we're, and in some cases, we're still working through that because uh, one of the, the – so the guy who couldn't reveal himself straight away, we've, we've arranged a, an equity stake for him, which had worked for him. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but we're still coming to terms with the other guy. So goodwill's there. If I went back again and thought through this deliberately and, and advised my former self, yeah, I would say be really clear about the engagement early on, and particularly the external. So we, we had the advantage of knowing the guys we're already friends with. Yeah. Happy to jump on board with us. They, they want to be they, they're eager to be involved. You've got to temper that a little bit with, okay, but you know, things aren't always rosy. Sometimes they're gonna get tense. So how how are we gonna yeah. how are we gonna set this up? And so But that's hard though too, right? Because you don't know, particularly when you're setting out, yeah. you know, you, it's hard, I imagine, that most people setting up their ICs, you know, they haven't if they haven't done it before, they don't know precisely about what that engagement is going to look like. How much of it's going to be done in house? Who's going to be preparing that reporting? Do we just want their ideas? 
um, you know, that, that's hard to establish from the outset when you haven't done it before. So you should probably cut yourself some slack. Yeah, you know? I guess maybe it's a way, a different way of looking at it is um, by all means go with good intentions, but eventually you've got to have commercial discussions yeah. with everybody. Yeah. Um, uh, so expectations are set properly. Um, and um, And if you just keep rolling on without it, then if there's a problem, it might be growing and you don't even know about it. Yeah, so sure. uh, we we set up the charter early on, but the charter didn't talk about term in the investment committee and it didn't talk about- um, Remuneration. Yeah, remuneration right. within the investment committee. Right. Um, and whether or not it needed to be um, uh, set and e- equitable between the, uh, the external parties. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but you want it to be, right? So um, that's- point you're going to eventually have to reach after the the um i guess the the happiness of joining the committee and everyone getting <laughs> going and the excitement of it it all being new once you start to get into the routine of it you go well we need to have um pretty clear indications of what expectations are for everyone so yeah we didn't do that so well at the beginning and we're sort of getting there now you're eventually going to have to have that discussion well, I'm imagining one of the guys, I can't remember which one you said, who's already got his full-time job pulling reports together at 11 p.m. at night, getting ready for uh, yeah, he's, he's, <laughs> ready for the IC. He's going to be wondering, hang on a minute, am I- What uh, am I doing this for other than a nice warm feeling? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah exactly. And reality is you want to you be respectful for people's time as well. Yeah. And the last thing you want is a someone who feels obligated to do something, the heart's not in it, but you want them to actually be yeah, engaged. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. that's the part- that engagement bit, we probably could have thought harder about it at the outset. I view that we got there in the end, but I think it's a byproduct of us rapidly getting it together and getting it rolling. And that, that age old analogy where we're then trying to fix a bicycle once it's already <laughs> rolling, mm. as opposed to getting the, everything set up um, from the outset. Uh, it, it's not an insurmountable problem, but I guess that's one of the things I would suggest for people to think about. Um, before they go down that track, yep. it's probably a lesser problem if you're out there interviewing and, and deliberately choosing IC members. If you're on the as, which is more likely, is you're probably going to be somewhere like um, what we were, where we were choosing people who already knew mm-hmm. because you you already that the known that credibility is already known. So you want to deal with people you know. Yeah, just be conscious that you've got to deal with this at some point. Yeah, sure. And just to just for the benefit of our listeners, you know what? Uh, could you give a sense of the range of you know what is commercial for in your experience? For you, know, I, you don't have to talk to your own I, 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 remuneration I still, agreements. I still, but, uh, I still don't one hundred percent know, but it's it's whatever. <laughs> like this is going to be a, a cop out, but it's it, it needs to be enough to f- have the, the external parties parties feel valued in what they're doing. Yeah, and the, and. If it's a small business like ours, you're you're offering something more than money. <laughs> you're offering people an opportunity to be involved in something. Um, so, so how do you put a how do you put a, a figure on that? So just, I'm going to be vague and say, give it's me a just, really it, wide range, yeah, Greg. Really wide. Well, it depends because in, in one case it was um, uh, they're they're willing to help on the basis that um, ultimately they will benefit from us using more of their fund, right? So that's one aspect. The other one is it's it's no there's no money involved, it's an equity stake. And so that we we worked out roughly what you would pay someone for that for the work that they were doing. So we went on a basis of how much would it cost to to set up all the models and all the rest of it, which is the first piece of work and then the ongoing piece of work, how much does it cost to at least in the first two years for the Review, uh, management monitor, and that yeah. staying up at 12 o'clock to put the stuff together. Yeah. And then we gave equivalent value in, in equity. Yeah, okay. You can't, you can't trade it, nothing. It's worth nothing really other than the hope it's going to be worth something in the future. Mm-hmm. Um, where our interests are aligned on that one because yeah, we, as, as business owners, we hope it's going to be worth something in the future too. Um, so de- the, the remuneration depends on what the person wants. But I guess mm-hmm. being vague um, – it's got to be enough to keep them interested is the, is the key part. So um, so that I think it's going to depend on the individual. Okay. 
Yeah, I'm just going to go and throw some ranges anyway because you've <laughs> dodged it too much. But I'm going to say from what you told me just then that it would be unwise to expect you're going to spend anything less than a few thousand bucks for an annual retainer at a very, very minimum to get someone with yeah, that sort of level that. of expertise. Yeah, it's going to be more right? than that. Um, but it may not be more than, say, $30,000. <laughs> uh, <laughs> then depending on who yeah, you get. Look, that's, right? I'd like, say that would be the – it depends on the, the, the commitment. It really depends on the commitment you're asking for the externals. Oh, yeah, and um, in this I'd example. Say, I'm going to say for an individual um, – 50 grand in whatever terms it comes out as is what you'd expect to pay the externals yeah um, for that quarterly that quarterly review commitment and that's that's monitoring and that that's coming prepared yeah. with all that sort of stuff that's that's an outsourcing of a whole bunch of the work that needs to get yeah. done yeah. that's not someone rocking up with their ideas and sort of scratching the chin for an hour you know no, that's, no. That, that's the actual sort of meat and bones yeah. of the investment they're, committee yeah, work they they're definitely um they're, they're they're committing their time outside the the full committee meetings a, a year. Yeah. Um. But yeah. So fifty grand in however dollar terms it's going to be, I'd say that's probably the the entry point. Okay. Um. If you so that's that's in the end that's the argument for externalizing, right? Because you can get the same outcome, definitely for a, a much more reasonable outlay for the business. Um. So. If you're wanting to set up an investment committee but you don't have the means within the business to do so straight away, then cost might be the deciding point of how how you go with it. Again, in our our point of view is we were driven by the choices um, based on our business philosophy, so that's the way we had to go regardless. So um, and we did cons- we did look and and muse at the externalizing the investment committee. And um, looking enviously at the lower cost it would commit to the business, but d- decided that the the aspect of control was more in keeping with our business philosophy. Very good. Um, to to sort of wrap things up a little bit, is there any advice or encouragement that you'd give to uh, an advisory business of maybe similar size to you? They're thinking about leveraging an IC, setting it up, going down the path. You know, we, we've talked about some of your journey. Is there anything that you would stick out to you um, that you think, yeah, they should absolutely do this? Um, or is there any particular kinds of businesses where you think actually maybe maybe this might not be necessarily the right fit? You now, what, what would be your broad advice as much as you can give it? Um, yeah, it's, it's a difficult question, so <laughs> you can hear me pausing. <laughs> uh, I think the issue is don't reinvent the wheel. So um, you, you think about... Uh, investment committee charters. You can spend hours trying to write those things, but um, thankfully, uh, Hugh, one of the members, was he was on another investment committee, and uh, thankfully, he may or may not have a have a like a template version we could use. Yeah. So um, there's stuff you want to which you want to make yours, and so is particularly yours. But there's other other bunch of stuff you can just just template, right? So um, as much as possible, use. The work of others to to make build those foundation blocks. Um, I think you absolutely need an investment committee because one of the reasons, again, which has sort of died away because we're going down the MDA line. We were gonna we were moving towards an SMA um, for our clients, mm-hmm. um, and so we needed an investment committee and need you needed to get all these things endorsed by the by the by the platforms. Yep. Um, whoever was going to run the SMA, so. If you're going down that line and um, you're trying to work out what you actually need, a good place to start is go to your platform and say, hey, if we were to set up an SMA, what do you require from a governance point of view? Yeah, and okay. they will come out with a list of stuff. And that's what we st- That's what we were using early on. So they wanted to see investment committee minutes. They wanted to see a charter. They wanted to see a whole bunch of stuff because they were required to do their due diligence on the investment committee before they were allowed to set up an SMA. Right. And so that um, kind of gave us a shortcut checklist of what we actually needed to be, you know, a, a, a fair income <laughs> investment committee um, as opposed to a bunch of people just sitting around every quarter and talking about stuff. So, yeah, I guess that goes back to the theme of use external guidelines and parties as much as you can to guide you to get all the fun foundation stuff set up. And start with the platforms. Yeah. That's um, 
again, get the right people together, as we were lucky to do, um, and then don't be afraid to change it as you go because <laughs> if our view changed from SMA to MDA, but um, but you, you, you be adaptive as you go, but don't, I guess, have you have strong ideas about how you want to do things, but be, always be open to change. Be uh, flexible. Yeah, yeah, be flexible. Particularly, I mean, anyone in the small business will have to be flexible. Uh, but that's, I guess, my, my advice to someone who is thinking about going down that line. Excellent. Greg, any final thoughts? Uh, no, I it, I think it's um, – if I was to say a final thought, I think the the connection between the investment piece, however it comes, the advisor and the client is enhanced if, you, you, if you're if you intimately involved with the investment committee. Um, so mm. – Ultimately, the benefit for the the business is you you control the process. Um, benefit to the client is um, is that by controlling the process, the advisor feels more in control. <coughs> so they're going to be more passionate about how yeah. they describe things to clients. Yeah, sure. And so if your one of your pieces is to make the your offering is a boutique offering, then um, it, the more the advisor feels connected with and passionate about the investment piece, the more that's going to flow through the clients and clients are going to like that. Yeah. Um, so that's where – I guess that's what where I think about it the most. But the, the thing which I'm going to go back to again, which you quite rightly pointed out, does it get a if – if you're just about the numbers, does it give you a better outcome from a, a return point of view? Probably not. Mm. But you've got to value that other piece, the connection to the – to the process and and the advisor and client connection to the to the boutique um, portfolio, and that's that's a benefit you get for it. Excellent. Well, Greg, thank you so much for uh, coming and sharing your thoughts. Really appreciate it. And uh, I'm sure all our listeners will be uh, much more informed. But starting with the platforms, that's great advice. You know, that's a, yep. that's a really good spot to start um, rather than reinventing the wheel. Greg, thanks very much for joining us. A pleasure. Thank you for listening to my, my musings. <laughs> and I, and the, the other thing which I really want to reinforce is it depends on whatever you want, right? So um, we're doing it our way. And then this is, the, this is what the advice business is about. There's plenty of ways to climb up the same hill for what you want to provide to clients. So this is what worked for us. So um, I'm not being prescriptive. This is how you've got to do it. Um, but hopefully our experience can help people think about how they want to do it for themselves. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you.